Good morning, everyone. I want to uh, put out a very short video here. This is going to be talking about uh, who uh, are our brothers and sisters. And I feel that the best place to begin would be right here at 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 19 through 20. And so I want to read this and then um, do a quick elaboration on it. And then it's up to you. Okay, so here the apostle tells us here, beginning at verse 19, we love because he loved us. Now, whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Look at that very closely. If you need to sit down and stare at it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, look at that teaching. That's very powerful. You see, our brothers and sisters are not persons who belong to the same religious groups that we belong to. You see, because religion basically is a creation of man. Back in Jesus' day, there was no such thing as, say, a Trinitarian or a Unitarian or the Seventh-day Adventist or Jehovah's Witnesses or Catholics or Protestants or the many divisive and contending denominations in the world today. Those things did not exist. If one even goes back into Genesis, Adam and Eve had uh, two sons, and we know them as Cain and Abel. Well, Cain slew his brother, Abel. That Cain slew his brother, Abel, doesn't diminish that Abel was not Cain's brother. That was his brother. So our brothers and sisters can do good by us. They can do bad by us. That we all have the same creator, the Most High God, and that we all have the same human parents, makes us all, makes the entire human family related. We're all brothers and sisters. What has occurred along the way is that religion was stood up and it created divisions among the human family. So we see all of these different silos, persons who belong to that religious group and that religious group. And even you have the many religious groups all claiming to be air quote Christians or they profess some faith in Christ and yet they hurl arrows and missiles at one another saying well those persons are not Christians we are well that's what that silo over here is saying about them well they're not Christians we are you see the divisions these were created by men if one is a true follower of Christ they must rise above the mire down here. Their thinking must be on a higher plane, on a higher frequency, on a spiritual level. Because if you wallow in this mess down here, with all this fighting among those claiming that they're Christians and those persons are not, then um, you've missed a boat. Uh, I had a, a commenter, and I appreciate this commenter, I appreciate the comments. I don't agree with the comment, but uh, I do appreciate the comments. And it's okay to uh, disagree, but as long as you understand, there's a difference. I understand the individual. I just don't agree with them. Where uh, he was saying, or he said rather, that um, Unitarians, as persons who believe that there's one God, are not Christians. Well, that's his opinion. But one must also consider, too, that Unitarians, they're Unitarians who don't believe that Trinitarians uh, are not Christians. So each camp thinks for themselves that they are correct. And I love throwing it to the mix. Well, you know, Jesus never told any of you to be called Christians. Who told you that? That's like back in the Garden of Eden when um, Adam uh, took some of the fruit from his wife and he ate and he hid himself from God. And God uh, comes into the garden and uh, calls out to Adam, like, where are you? And Adam 
said to God, I'm hiding from you. And God says, well, why are you hiding? And Adam said, because I'm naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? So I say to those who are, whether you're a Trinitarian or a Unitarian or whatever, who told you that? Who told you to be called Christians? Because Jesus certainly didn't tell you that. And you can't show that any place. Jesus never used that expression, Christian. His apostles, the persons that he chose and taught, never used that expression. Christian and Christianity, these are expressions and these are creations of men. Yes, we do see the expression Christian, Christians mentioned twice, maybe three times in the Bible. But the expressions are never used by Christ followers. They're used by persons who did not like or had problems with Christ followers. That is, haters of Christ followers. You see, as a black man, there are persons here in the United States who don't like me because of the color of my skin. And they have assigned derogatory expressions and names to label me. You guys know that word, right? The N word, you know that word. Well, that wasn't a word that I created for myself. And then I call myself that. That's a title that others created and assigned to me. That's what occurred long ago. There were individuals who did not like Christ's followers. So they assigned a name to them. And today, millions, billions even, have taken that title, have taken that name upon themselves. Something Jesus never commanded. And then by creating these expressions such as uh, Trinitarians and Unitarians, you see, all that stuff is divisive. And what individuals have a tendency of doing, and we all do this, we love this us versus them type mentality. Jesus didn't create that. Jesus never taught such a thing. And think about Jesus' life. Who did he hang around with? Tax collectors. Uh, there was a woman who was uh, an adulteress. The person who died uh, next to him on the day that he died. A condemned man, an evildoer, a wicked man. Jesus promised him paradise. Jesus did not cause divisions. He came to those who needed to be helped. A woman um, who had an issue, a female issue. Just look at his life. He wasn't going around saying, well, this person over here is my brother and my sister, and this one is not. That makes no sense. If one looks at the promised resurrection there at John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus says, do not marvel at this, for all in their graves will hear his voice and come out. And two, look at his last moments in life, where he's hanging up there on that uh, staru, he's been tortured, uh, nailed to that instrument of death, hoisted up there, and had that... Uh, Staru slammed into a hole, probably drawing every bone and nerve in his body. The pain had to be excruciating. To have a thorn of crowns thrust down on his head had to be painful. To have his side pierced, to be given um, vinegar water, so to speak. That's cruel. That shows how cruel we can be as humans. And we do have a history of cruelty with regards to others within the human family who really are our brothers and sisters. If everyone took the uh, the stance that everyone out there are not my brothers and sisters, then obviously they're not going to be because that's what you believe that, that they're not. They're not your brothers and sisters because that's what you want to believe and that's what you want them to believe. I think that we are a foolish lot because we choose things such as skin color, yet God created the variety in the human family. But we will take something like skin color and use that as a cause for division. Religion being stood up, that being used as a cause for division and an excuse to say, well, that person over there is not my brother. But if you read from John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, it shows how hypocritical we are. Because we're told right there that uh, at verse 20, whoever claims to love God, 
and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So persons who pick and choose and say, well, those persons over there, they're not my brother and sister. Well, that would mean then that uh, you don't love God. You are a hypocrite. Because that is not how God views his creation. God created all of us. So why would God hate his creation? Even Jesus showed an act of love. In my view, one of the greatest acts of love that one could commit. You see, when he was hanging up there, did he complain? No. He cried out to the Father in pain and asked the Father to forgive those who were persecuting him and who would put him to death. What's wrong with us? And I mean that. What is wrong with us? It's this us versus them mentality that I will never, never accept. Now, I fully understand there are individuals out there who will not like me because of my skin color. They will not like me because of how I dress, because I used to be in the military. It could be my political views. It could be my views on God and Christ. It can be anything. People will use an excuse to uh, cause a division to say, well, that person is not a brother and sister. When I worked in Washington, D.C. for many years, I met people from all walks of life. I worked in a federal agency where there was a, a hodgepodge, a mixture of persons from all over the world. Asians within the many different Asian Asiatic groups, Pakistanis, Indians, uh, just a, a mixture of people in the world. And we became associates. We became friends very close friends and they would address me as brother i would address them as brother sister you see but what has occurred is that religion has caused divisions and i say this to those of you who seem to wallow in divisions and you can't get past that something in your psyche viscera doesn't let you get past being divisive as if that's what you want to be and you take this finger here and you point it at those persons over there and say, well, those persons over there are not brothers and sisters. Those persons over there are not believers because they don't think and believe as I do. It's like, who are you? Who put you in charge? Why is it OK for you to point a finger at those persons over there and say they're not brothers and sisters? But you would become offended if they did that to you. They, many of them, believe the same thing about you. They will say, well, you're not a brother or a sister or that you're not a Christian. And even to have individuals who are so arrogant to say things. And, and a commenter did say this, and I, I was taken aback by it because, but I'm not surprised at this because I'm used to it. For individuals to impose their, this superiority, self-righteous complex upon others, rather than taking a route of humility, they will say things like, well, it's out of place to say that those persons are brothers and sisters. Why so? Because that's how you feel. You see, as a black man, I'm fully aware of my history. And among my people, we have had persons not only strip away from us our African identities and have imposed on them. European identities, which we still carry today, and also a foreign and European religion called Christianity. Others defining who we are and telling us what to do and what to believe. Well, I'm very sensitive about that. I just don't like it when others seem to think that they know more than you or they're just, they have this self-righteousness about them as if you don't know what you're talking about and that you can't figure things out on your own. And to tell me that it's improper to uh, use the expression brothers and sisters towards others because that's not how they feel. How arrogant is that? Does that show humility? 
How can a person like that call themselves disciples of Christ? Jesus never did that. So why would one want to wallow in all this divisiveness? If a person doesn't like you, if they even hate you, that doesn't mean that they're not a brother or a sister. Jesus even commanded to love your enemies, did he not? He didn't say hate your enemies. He said love them. Why? Because they are your brother and sisters. Did Jesus uh, show hate towards those who persecuted him and who would put him to death? No. He showed an act of love towards them and asked the Father to forgive them. And the reason to forgive them is because they didn't know what they were doing. So I think that many missed a boat here. And um, I simply will not accept uh, or subscribe to that type of thinking. And with regards to believing that uh, this, this Trinity teaching, there's no way. Because if I believed in a man-made teaching, which was officially formulated in uh, 325 AD at the uh, Nicene Council. You see, that's some 300 years after Christ ascended. So back in the days of the apostles and in the days of Christ, no such thing existed. So if it didn't exist, it would not have been taught. The people back then, the Jews, the 12 tribes of Israel, didn't know anything about there being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This individual even said that I implied that um, Trinitarians are not um, monotheistic. No, I'm not implying that. I'm stating explicitly, and I'm stating as a matter of factly, Trinitarians are not monotheistic. They believe that there's three gods all rolled up in this mysterious essence of one. Look at it. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. But they're one? That doesn't add up. That's confusing. And if God himself says that he alone is God, and if his own son, during his temptation, in this discussion with Satan says, you must worship God and him alone. You must worship. That's enough for me. I don't need to even consider something called the Trinity. Because God has stated, his son has stated that there is one God. I don't need to engage in discussions going back and forth about some man-made document because uh, I want to believe that Jesus is God. In, in my view, it's disrespectful. The Trinity doctrine is disrespectful and it does a slap in the face. It is a middle finger to God. Because what a person has done, what that doctrine has done, it has stood up other gods, the Son and the Holy Spirit, next to the one who is. You see, these Trinitarians, I put up a video a few days ago, and I gave uh, 17 scriptures because that's all the time I had. I've got well over 100 of them and that list is growing. That show that there's only one God. This mysterious Trinity doctrine that came on the scene after Christ ascended. I mean, come on, folks. If you had a choice to make, to listen to what God says about himself, what his son says about his father and about himself, compared to what a Trinity doctrine says, who are you going to believe? Why all this defense and trying to stand up a document that came from men? No defense towards God, no defense towards his son with regards to who they say they are. And that question Jesus asked his disciples that Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, Trinitarians, why don't you answer? I ask you, but you won't answer. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Is Jesus God or is he the son of God? If you go beyond that and try to use many words, then your yes is not a yes. And your no is not a no. That's a yes and no question. Is Jesus God? Yes or no? Is he the son of God? Yes or no? 
And again, how would you answer him if he asked you that question? There at Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Take the emotionalism out of it. You must become rational. Oh, and I should say here, lastly, let me conclude here. Uh, an individual asks a question, and I appreciate these questions. I really do because they give me things to talk about, about prayer. When you pray to the Father, the assumption is that you're praying through his Son. And all one has to do is look at the, the model or example in prayer that Jesus gave that Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, this is how you shall pray. How does that prayer begin? Our Father in heaven. When you say this, you are acknowledging that there is only one God, the Father in heaven. And who taught that prayer? Jesus. So that lets the Father know that when you begin your prayer with our Father in heaven, that you listened to his Son who taught you that prayer. You don't have to say at the end of a prayer in the name of Jesus. That's no word written. Jesus never told you to do that. The Father knows that you're praying, and he knows that you're praying through the office of his son, because his son taught you that. You listened to his son. Don't you get it? You don't have to assume some special position, such as kneeling and closing your eyes or folding your hands or reaching your arms out into the sky. None of that's taught. See, all that comes from men. We must be able to distinguish what comes from men and these things are assumed rather than what comes from God through his son. So yes, when you pray, you're praying through the office of his son. It's proper to conclude your prayers with amen because what you're saying when you say amen, that you are in agreement with God and that you trust that he will do what he says that he will do. In other words, you're trusting in him. You're saying, so be it. I entrust, I put my trust in you. That's what you're saying. And also, I would recommend that one looks at uh, what Jesus uh, taught there at Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5, where we are to pray in private. Because if you do not pray in private, then you're a hypocrite, according to Christ. You're praying so others can see you pray. You see, my prayers not for you to know. My prayers are private. They're between me and my father. Your prayers are between you and your father in heaven. We both have the same God. We all have the same God and father, but we pray to him privately. Our requests are tailor-made. So again, pay attention to what Christ taught there in Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. And you have those who are within the camp of Christianity. They really get agitated about that. They use many words to cloud the issue, but Christ is really quite clear there. This is how we are to pray. Do not allow Christianity to define for you how you are to pray or even how you to believe. Simply obey what God commanded of us at Luke chapter 9, verse 35, that we listen to his son. If you can do that, if you can really listen to his son, as opposed to listening to all these many religious groups, then you're going to be okay because you're obeying God's command. You're showing obedience to that command. It is a very difficult thing to do if you are already within a religious group or organization because they have already indoctrinated you to do a certain thing this way. They've got you laden down with ritualism. You see the person to your left bowing their heads and closing their eyes to pray, so that's what you do. But did Jesus teach that? Person A over here believes that uh, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that uh, Jesus is God. So you believe it too. You enable one another. But do you ask yourselves, what does God say about that? You're believing what men say. You don't ask the creator. You don't even ask his son. His son is asking you, that is Trinitarians and those who believe that Jesus is God. Jesus is asking you, who do you say I am? How are you guys answering him? Are you running away from that? Are you running away from him? So in that last video that I put up 
that was entitled Trinitarians, the gist of that video was to show that you got persons out there who do not believe that Jesus is God, but yet they say that they are Christians. And you got persons who believe that Jesus is God, who point a finger at those over there who don't believe that Jesus is God. And they say, well, those persons over there, they're not Christians. They're not brothers and sisters because they don't believe as I do. That is precisely the point I was trying to drive home in that video to show the contention and the confusion. Because if a person was newly interested in, say, becoming a Christian or joining some religious group and they see this back and forth, well, they believe in God. Well, they believe that Jesus is God, but they don't. But they both say that they're Christians. So which group do I join? The one that yells the loudest? Christianity sows Babel, Babel. It sows confusion. They cannot come under one roof and reach a consensus or an agreement. Instead, they fight and contend with one another. I suppose if one uh, can put in their minds that those persons over there, they may call themselves Christians, we say that they're not, that gives them excuse to show hatred towards them and animosity towards them. See, they create that. It's like a self fulfilling prophecy. But Christ didn't teach any of that. So I would recommend to individuals who want to follow Christ, do this. It's simple. Follow Christ. Why are you following religion? Why are you following the beliefs of others? Follow what he taught. It really is that simple. You're not missing out on anything if you don't join some church group. Do you really think that putting in attendance at some church or church groups is giving you points with God? No. What pleases God is that you do his will. And one of his wills, and it's a major will, and it is a command, is that we listen to his son. It really is that simple. What convolutes and uh, confuses the issue is that Christianity as a whole doesn't want you to do that. It wants you to listen to it. It wants to tell you what to believe. And it has its ministers out here. YouTube is saturated with them. The mega churches are saturated with them. They're in your neighborhoods. They tell you what they want you to believe. They'll give you a little bit of entertainment to get you emotionally worked up, but they want to be the telling. They don't want you to think on your own. They will try to make you feel bad about yourself if you believe differently than what they will have you believe. Don't buy into it. Do not allow them to uh, paint you into a corner. Do not allow them to define you. Follow Christ. Why? Because he knows the way and he is the way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. You can't get to the Father through religion. Because that would be another way, would it not? Christ is the way. The person, the one that God sent, he is the way. So follow him. This is Arjun Harris. Thank you for listening.